Good morning, church. Good morning. Sometimes I can't be heard until this morning. I feel like I'm just a little loud. So, a little dreary out today, but the rain is moving out. I checked the radar. It's going to be out. We should have another uh, nice day today. A little cooler, but what's to be expected? Just what? December is like next week. So, mm -hmm. we have to Thursday. have to get prepared for that because it's going to get colder and that white stuff's going to start falling again. I know, you're not supposed to swear in church. How dare you? Right? You're forgiven though. <laughs> it is a four-letter word. <laughs> it is. It is four-letter. Um, today marks the first day of Advent. Uh, I just, I love Advent. I love the season. I love what it represents. We're going to talk about that a little bit more here in a bit, but um, this is also the start of our Advent series. So today we still kick off our Advent Conspiracy Series, a series where we're going to learn how we can substitute consumption with compassion by practicing four simple but very powerful countercultural concepts. Today we kick off with worship fully and what that means. And we're not going to talk about um, so much how we worship or the things that we can do to worship, we're going to really dive into what worship is because worship is something completely different than most of the world considers it. So looking forward to that. And then next week uh, we'll be on Spend Less with Pastor Mark and uh, then the following week he will bring us a message on how we can give more. And then we'll wrap it up uh, on the final Sunday before Christmas with love all. So, uh, as most of you know, Mark and I both work outside jobs, so he is patiently waiting for a maintenance crew to show up and get the plane ready to fly. And hopefully that will be in about, what, 45, 45 minutes? minutes? Yeah. 45. So we'll, yeah. S we'll know in a little bit if he texts Lori and says, eh, still, <laughs> still waiting. As I know, he would much rather be here than, than there. Um, but if you want to know more about it, you can go out to our website, Grace Street Path Church, and just click on the Advent Conspiracy. We've got a little pop-up that comes up that has all the uh, important information about what's coming up, including a link to that series. Then next Saturday, so this week, Mark and I will have to work long distance to get everything prepared, but we will be... Can, uh, we'd love to take this space and make it a different thing. So next Saturday morning at 9 a.m., this will be a dining room. Mm -hmm. And the men will be coming together for a men's breakfast where we will uh, enjoy a meal together. We will fellowship. And that's just a big Christian word for we're going to just talk and, and enjoy one another's company while we eat. And then we'll also have a devotional at that time. So uh, looking forward to that. The following Saturday, because we're just going to pack it all in. We're going to get as much in as we can this this coming month. We're going to go Christmas caroling. We will start here. That way we can plug in all the food and get it all warmed up. And then we're going to uh, travel around. And Carla is working hard right now to get things all set up for caroling. We'll be doing some individual homes as well as going to some nursing homes uh, to carol for those folks. And then Christmas Eve. We will be having our 11 o'clock candlelight service, and that's 11 p.m., not a.m., but 11 p.m., and uh, this space, when the lights are out, and it's just the trees, because we've got another tree back here and one over here in the corner, and then we have lights that go pretty much all the way around except for this wall here, and then we'll have candles uh, battery operated, because certainly we don't want to have the fire department come out. Um, but it just is a beautiful evening of learning and, and reading the uh, Christmas story as well as singing some beautiful, beautiful Christmas songs. So I invite you to join us for that. The following morning, we will not have service because we're going to get out of here about 12-ish in the morning. That will be our Sunday service. So we want everybody to be able to sleep in and just enjoy Christmas Day with their family. Uh, we haven't set the date yet, but we're going to pick a Saturday in January and show the next uh, installment of the God's Not Dead series called We the People. 
and this series or this one is uh, Pastor Dave gets behind some folks who are homeschoolers and goes up against uh, a government that is trying to take some of their rights away. And then in February, coming up very quickly, uh, Wade just posted up that it was like 70 some days left before our next racing. So I think we've got just over 70 days before we hit season 18 of our Orange Track Racing League. As you can see here, that's part of the track. That's not quite half the track. Our track's about 42 feet long. So it starts way over there by the kitchen door and runs all the way down here, almost to the entryway. So uh, looking forward to, to getting that back together again and, and enjoying some racing there. So uh, for those of you that are worshiping with us online, uh, Diane will be putting in the link to the worship music so that once the online portion of the service is over, you can click on that link and go out and listen to the same music that we will be enjoying here in the sanctuary. <sighs> Time to slow down. That's a lot coming up, but that's not what worship is about. Our call to worship this morning is where we're going to start, and we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 14 and 16. And this is from the NRSV, or the New Revised Standard Version. Hear what Jeremiah writes. He says, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up from, for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. This is a long time before Jesus even comes into play. And here Jeremiah is telling all of us what the Lord had told him. A promise that will be fulfilled, that will be for not just Judah, not just Israel, but all of us. This, this extends to all of us. And that righteous branch that will spring up, that is Jesus that they're talking about. And in that day, I, I just, I, I can't imagine, I, I can't even fathom what that will be like, but I can't wait. Now, as I mentioned before, and, and so this is a moment of waiting, a, a moment where we're waiting for the Lord to come again, or waiting for his arrival, and that is what Advent is. Advent is a call to us as followers of Christ to remember the birth of our Savior. Now, the Latin and the Greek meanings for these are, are different, but very similar. This is Advent means coming. The Lord is coming. That's what Advent is. And in the Greek, it means arrival. So we are waiting for the arrival, the coming of our Lord Jesus. Advent is the season of the year that leads up to our celebrating Jesus' birth on Christmas. Now, we all enjoy Christmas. We all enjoy family, and if you're about knee-high to all of us adults, you enjoy getting all those presents. But that's what we're going to talk about today, too. And here's the thing. Until very recently, Advent wasn't celebrated by evangelical or what we would call non-denominational churches, such as ourselves. It was basically a tradition that was celebrated by the Anglicans, the Catholics, the Lutherans, and the Methodists. That would be their, their primary group. And it, it just, I, it, Mark and I talk about this all the time, and it just blows our mind. He and I live very different, yet very parallel lives. Both of us grew up in the Methodist Church. So both, both of us grew up celebrating Advent. And so it's, as a non-denominational non church, it's still very important for us to really dig into what this is season is about. It is a time of expectant waiting and preparation for the celebration of the nativity of Jesus and Christmas by us as the Christian church. 
It's also a time for expectant waiting and preparation for Jesus' second coming, his long-awaited return, so that it's twofold. We're celebrating what has happened, but we're also preparing for what is to come. The term Advent is also used in the Eastern Orthodoxy for the 40-day nativity fast, which has practices that are different from those of what we practice here in the West. Now, the season begins on the fourth Sunday before Christmas, and this year it's a little unique. It only happens every few years, but Christmas is on Sunday. So because of that, Advent started today. Its purpose is to help believers remain focused on the birth of Christ and his glorious return. It is a season that is divided into four weeks, and each week features a different, what we call a liturgical theme. The first two weeks of Advent are to look ahead to the second coming of Christ for when he brings us home. And the last two weeks are to reflect on Christ's coming into the world and the promises of the gifts that God gave us in the redemption, salvation, and eternal life that we get through Jesus Christ. Now traditionally, the first week remembers the hope and expectation of the Jewish people as they looked forward to the Savior's arrival. But it also reminds us as believers today that we are to wait expectantly for his return. Now the second week uh, focuses on preparation. So over many centuries, God prepared the hearts of the Jews for Christ's coming just as he is now working in our hearts to prepare us for his second coming. And then the third week will joyfully celebrate the coming of the Messiah and the final week celebrates God's peace and love. Hear the words from Isaiah 9, 2, and 6, and 7. The people walking into darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. And then in verse 6 it says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So this morning, the first candle that we light is the candle of hope. We're going to start digging into this morning the true meaning of what Christmas is, not what the culture has created it to be. Increasingly over the years, Christ has been taken out of Christmas, and instead, the world has focused on materialistic things and values. I find it interesting, it's just been within my lifetime that this past Friday has taken on a new meaning, when we call it Black Friday. Now, there was a movement to try and change that. Somebody wanted to call it Big Friday or something like that because it, they just didn't like the, the terminology of black, but it didn't catch on. But here's the thing. These candles of hope, of peace, of joy, and love have become spend, haste, push, and shove. Now, courtesy of the pandemic, the stores aren't nearly as full as what they used to be. In fact, I don't remember stores being as busy as they were the first time I went to Westdale Mall back in the 80s. And it wasn't even Christmas time, but I could barely walk in this mall. And it was a, it, I say was, because most of it's gone. It was a big mall, and I could barely weave my way through. And we've all seen the news reports, and I think back to when I was, you know, back in the late 80s, when my daughter was, after my daughter was born, everybody wanted a cabbage patch. And people fought over them. 
And here's, here's the problem with that. Hundreds of injuries have happened over the years, and I'm sure it's even higher than hundreds, it's probably thousands. But there's also been many, many deaths at the hands of a toy or a TV or whatever else it was. This is so far from the real meaning of Christmas, so far from the real meaning of the season. As Christians, we bought into this hype and we've gotten so far away from the true meaning as well. And I'm, I'm not blanketing and saying that you all are like that. Please don't take that that way. But there are a lot of Christians that have fallen into that trap. And over the next four weeks, we're going to remove all that noise. We're going to remove all that hype. And we're going to get back to what Christmas is about. The gift that God has given us. Oftentimes you'll hear Mark or I say, God has given us this gift. Don't leave it unwrapped. In the season, we could even go one step further and say, don't leave it under the tree unwrapped. This is why we chose this series for this season called the Advent Conspiracy. And today, we'll start by learning what it means to worship fully. Now, even the icon that's up there with his hands raised, it might be raised for music, it might be raised for <coughs> prayer. But are those things truly what worship is? The invitation to join Advent Conspiracy is a call to remain at the side of Jesus and worship him. No matter how strongly the cultural demands of Christmas pull at us. So here we have the tenets of this series. To spend less, to be next week, followed by giving more and loving all. But today, one of the most important things is we're going to learn and talk about what it means to worship fully. Now... We have a video for you this morning, and unfortunately, because of copyright, it will be silent. But the words that will be on the screen are, in fact, the silence is just taking out a song. The important part is the words.
ship look like to you? We just saw a bunch of things that people think worship is and what it truly is. Worship is not an emotion. It's not about how you feel. The biggest thing when people, and, and we saw it in the, in the video, music does not produce worship. It can create an emotional response. Who likes good music? Let's face it, we all like to listen to good music, right? Each of us may have different tastes in what we like. Um, I haven't listened to secular music in forever. I listen to a lot of the local and even some of the national radio stations or Christian stations because that's what I want filling me. And yes, it can create an emotional response. But here's the thing. Music can be an expression of worship. And it's not about the songs that we sing. We may sing a song that you don't like. We may sing a song that's in a tempo that we don't like. We might like the song, but it's like, a little faster, come on, just a little bit. No, it's not about that. Worship is not something that we do expecting something in return either. We don't come to church and worship expecting that we're going to get something out of it. Uh, maybe that's healing or uh, something that you think you need or want, that's not what it's about. We can't expect something in return because worship isn't, as we saw in the, this video, it's not about us. It's not about what happens here in this space or in any other church for us. Worship cannot happen also when our heart and our attitude is in the wrong place. Now, who's had their heart or attitude in the wrong place? It's rhetorical, nobody has to answer that, I will. It has been just over 24 hours ago. I had to reset. If we don't begin the Advent season with a heart of worship, and those of you who've been listening to Christian music for a while, you're going to be singing that in your head now, so sorry about that everything else will fall apart if we're not in the right frame of mind. The way that we spend, the way that we give, the way that we love, the way that we worship are all radically changed when we worship in the way that God designed us to worship. We have to get to a place of true worship. Worship is not something that is done out of obligation. Well, 9.30, better get in the car and head to church. Got to be there. It's not an obligation. It's something that we do because of God. It's an opportunity to get back to the heart of the Christ Christmas narrative. And we're going to look at the Christmas narrative this morning. And we're going to look at a few stories and how worshiping fully comes into play with these central characters and how they expressed their worship. Now, I'm going to first turn to Luke chapter 1. And in Luke chapter 1, Mary will be submitting to God's will. This is Luke 1, 26 and 38. It says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, the angel told her. For you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. 
His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. But the word of God will never fail. Here's where Mary worships. She responds, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. Now, in our society today, this happens a lot. People get the whole getting pregnant thing backwards. But here's the thing. In her time, that meant either she would be ostracized forever, never getting married, and being thrown out by her family. She'd be wandering in, in wherever by herself. Or worse, or maybe not, depending on the, your perspective, she would have been stoned. They would have taken her out and stoned her to death. Now, the one thing I thought interesting as I read this passage is, and I, it, it, for the first time it popped into my head this week was, did you notice that she didn't do what Sarah did? Remember what Sarah did? Sarah laughed at the angel of the Lord and said, yeah, right, whatever. I'm old, I'm not gonna get pregnant. No. Mary simply, she didn't, you know, she wasn't saying I won't do this or anything. Else. She just simply asked how it could happen. And the angel of the Lord told her. And once she knew what that plan was, she willingly or voluntarily submitted to the will of God. She trusted the Lord with her life. And then she had to go to Joseph and say, um, uh, Joseph, I'm pregnant. Now, we've already talked about what could happen to her. Let's go back. We're going to jump to Matthew 1, 18 and 25. This is how Jesus' Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. Pretty stand-up guy here. Most would have had her stoned. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The angel continued saying that all of this occurred to fulfill the, the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And ultimately, he would wake up from the dream. He would take Mary as his wife, and they would name him Jesus. He did what the angel of the Lord commanded, despite of the way that it looked. We would say, despite the optics of that today. He did what the Lord wanted him to do. Now, imagining it from Mary's side of how she was going to tell Joseph and her family and friends, imagine how Joseph had to go and tell his family and friends. It's pretty uncomfortable for both. But here's the thing. He worshipped, and he worshipped through obedience. Then if we flip back to Luke, chapter 1, starting at verse 39, we have Mary showing up at Elizabeth's home. And Elizabeth gets filled with the Holy Spirit. And she's, she just can't believe that 
Mary is there. This favored woman of God is there. And she's so excited. In fact, remember we said she's pregnant. She's about six months along here. John, who we will become, come to know as John the Baptist, flips. And I, I've never been pregnant, so I don't know how that's going to feel. But he did. He, did, he flipped it for joy. <laughs> Unborn, he already knew that Mary was carrying the Savior. And then we follow that up. So Mary opens her home. This is uh, worshiping through hospitality by serving. Elizabeth serves Mary. Mary is so moved by all of this. And I can't even imagine seeing Elizabeth glowing from the Holy Spirit, right? But Mary is so moved that she sings a song of gratitude to God. And we, you can read that in Luke 1, 46 through 55. So while we said music isn't necessarily worship, but it can be an expression of worship, Mary worshipped in song. Now let's shift away from the family here and go out. And in this case, we're going to go to Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. Here we have this group of shepherds. They're out, I mean, you know, we think it gets dark at night. <laughs> These guys are out. There's no light whatsoever, except for if there's no clouds. They have the, the stars and the moon. And this is a group of people who are looked down on by society. They're considered thieves and, and low lives. And they're not looked upon very well. And, and we'll see this in Jesus' ministry when he gets older. He doesn't look at anybody differently based on their station in life. But even then, can you imagine tending sheep? It's like, unless one of them runs off, you're just like, mm, come on, over here. You, you just kind of, you don't move around too, too much. You kind of, it's kind of a lazy, kind of a, it, it's not that it's not hard work as it was. But these outcasts, per se, just never even got the opportunity to worship in the synagogue because of how they were like the, near the bottom of the totem pole. Yet, the angels come and they say, don't be afraid. Now, how scary is that going to be? You're out in the middle of nowhere and all of a sudden these angels appear out of nowhere all this light. Don't be afraid. What's the first thing you're going to do? Yeah, I'm going to shut her. <coughs> but they say, don't be afraid. And then they are praising God. And they're saying, glory to God in the highest. And peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And they tell the shepherds about what is happening in Bethlehem. And what do they do? These guys that don't move fast for much of anything. They showed worship by hurrying to see what the angels had told them about. Something that they may never have gotten that opportunity to do. And then we can flip back to Matthew chapter 2. And we have another group. And we like to sing We Three Kings, right? We Three Kings of Bethlehem. There were more than three kings. I'm pretty sure of it. But here's a group of who we will call Magi. And they are, they are uh, confronted by this knowledge. This, this, and they've, they've studied the scriptures. And they've determined that the Lord is coming. And then they see this star in the east, right? And what do they do? They go to visit Jesus. Now, they probably spent two years on this journey. That's a long time to travel. We think it's bad. The 
Um, Mark should be get, getting on that plane prayerfully in about 10 minutes. We worry about getting on a plane or getting in a car and driving somewhere and how long that might take. Yesterday we traveled, traveled for a family Thanksgiving and it's like, oh, it's, 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 it's ever, it seems like it takes forever to get there but it takes no time to get back. That's, uh, I mean, and we're thinking, these guys spent two years walking through the desert, bringing with them all the food that they're going to need, bringing with them probably several camels or donkeys and servants to help get them there. Can you imagine all the, the, you know, probably didn't pack like we do for clothes, but, you know, they, they went. Here's the thing. So they're bringing these very expensive gifts and they spent all this time the Magi worshipped through sacrifice. A sacrifice of time and talent. And in this case, talent meaning their, the gifts that they brought. But what can we learn from each of these different scenarios? We can learn that worship is for whom? Not us. Not you. Not me. It is for God and God only. And Paul outlines for us. Gotta love Paul. He teaches us so much. But he outlines for us in Romans 12, 1 and 2 what true worship is. And that is, starting in verse 1, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Here we are given our motivation to worship because all of what God has given to us. Scripture tells us in Romans 5 a little bit earlier that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's what he has given for us. Through his grace, his love, his mercy, his forgiveness. These are things that this ministry, this Grace Street Church, Prayer Care Church Ministries is founded on. If you see, you've seen our, our street sign logo, it's up on the building and that, but there's a bigger logo that shows an actual street sign just like it would with the different roads on it. And it does say, top says Grace Street Church, but it also says God's forgiveness, God's mercy, and God's grace. As we continue reading in this passage, Paul tells us how to worship. Give your bodies to God. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. It's about giving all of ourselves. Giving our bodies. But it's more than just our physical bodies. It's about giving our hearts. It's about giving our minds our thoughts, our attitudes, our words, and other words probably are just can fill your minds as we sit here and think about it. Then there's those Christians that are out there, supposed Christians. They claim to have a relationship with God, but all they're doing is giving God lip service. They have not let God transform them. There's the key. You need to let God transform you. This means letting go of the world's ways and supposed wisdom and replacing it with God's. And it's not something you're going to just do hourly or daily. It's a moment by moment thing. Where your mind goes, the saying says, the body will follow. You have to decide if that is going to be letting your mind go with the world or with God. It is in worship that we are responding to something, someone greater than ourselves. It is showing honor and reverence to God 
true worship, to worship fully means it is God-centered. Worship is not any one act, but it can include several different things. We've already talked about one, that was music, but it can also include praying and reading God's word and singing. Uh, maybe it's taking communion or serving. These all are acts that can be lead to worship, but of themselves are not necessarily worship. Some people read God's word just to say, yeah, got that done today, check that off. That's, I do a Bible reading plan. I, that keeps me grounded. I like to be able to read through the scriptures, but it's not so that I can just check off each chapter and verse that I've read to say that, oh, I read through the Bible. If I'm not transformed by what I'm reading, it doesn't do us any good. It's a state of heart. If it's not something that's pleasing to God, then it's probably something you're doing out of obligation. And we have a perfect example of this in Genesis chapter 4. We can go right to the beginning and get plenty of examples. Cain and Abel. Both of them brought sacrifices to the Lord. But listen to the wording of this. Cain brought some of his crops from his fields. Now, Abel brought the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flocks. Let me say that again. Cain brought some of his crops from his field. But Abel brought the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flocks. Some of his crops, best portions of the firstborn lambs. Right there we have the reasoning why Cain acted out of obligation. He wasn't worshiping. He was acting out of obligation, whereas Abel acted out of faith and admiration for God, and that was worship. Last week, uh, Pastor Mark quoted A.W. Pink, and he's got some good quotes. Listen to what he calls true worship. He says, it is a redeemed heart occupied with God, expressing itself in adoration and thanksgiving. He packs so much into just this short sentence. Another uh, pastor that I like to follow uh, or read because he's no longer with us, is A.W. Tozer. And he said, true worship is to be so personally and hopelessly in love with God that the idea of a transfer of affection never even remotely exists. In other words, you are so hopelessly in love with God that you would never change that affection for <coughs> God for anything that the world has out there. Mary submitted to God's will. Joseph obeyed and followed God's plan. The ways that they worshipped are similar but different. We have submission and we have obedience. What's the difference? Submission is an inward attitude. She chose to submit to the will of God. Obedience is an outward action is how he was going to respond to Mary's being pregnant. Mary voluntarily placed God's will over her own, and Joseph, Joseph did what he was told to do. And he was blessed by it. And she was blessed by her obedience, or by her submission. Elizabeth opened her home. She worshipped by serving, and John worshipped by jumping for joy. You know, how often have we gone to, some of you may have been to concerts where you're jumping for joy. That's how John worshipped. It wasn't an emotion. He was worshipping the Lord. Mary then also worshipped by singing the song of gratitude to God. The shepherds stopped their work to go and find this gift. The Messiah. 
They stopped and they went. And the part that we don't read in that story is they left their flocks all by themselves. They trusted in God to watch over the flocks. So they worshiped through their trust in God. When was the last time you hurried to go worship God? The Magi were confronted by so many things. They were confronted by Herod when they stopped to ask about this Messiah. But their biggest worshiping was done through sacrifice, the sacrifice of their time and treasure. Two years of travel in that time would have been a lot more than expensive than that plane ticket. Or the gas. Well, yeah, gas isn't quite that high yet. They also humbled themselves as they worshipped this king. These were, the Magi were important people in and of themselves, and they came and they worshipped a king. They humbled themselves. These examples of worship are so very far from the hustle and bustle of what Christmas has become. How can we worship with everything that God has done in our lives? Think about how you can do that. What are you going to do differently today, this Christmas season, and into the future? We saw the angels come and invite the shepherds, right? Well, who are you going to invite to church? As we go through this series and understand the Christmas story, we will do so that will help us to understand it in a much deeper way. And when we do that, we will be worshiping God more fully. It's not just this message. It's the next one and the next one. And through the series and even beyond to the, the sermons that will come after this series. Do not let it stop here in this space, in this time. Don't let it stop once the music has ended and you walk out that door. Read this Christmas story with this new lens. And if you need a Bible and you don't have one, let me know, we will get you one. It's too important. Christmas marks the moment where God's promise was fulfilled I love to form tiny fingers and all. Nearly every character in the Christmas story that encountered our King, our Lord Jesus Christ, responded in the same way. They worshiped. It's a moment that deserves our full attention and praise. Jesus deserves celebration, one that is creative. It, it might be loud but it directs every heart to him and his way. Let's make a conscious effort to reorient our hearts towards Christ. Christmas began with worship. May it end with worship. Father, as we have learned a little bit more what it means to worship fully, we thank you. We thank you for the examples that we have throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament. We learned from Cain and Abel what it meant to truly worship you. We find out from these participants in the Christmas story what it means to worship you. Even in light, Father, of being ostracized or looked down on, or we want to worship you. Father, the scriptures tell us that as we grow closer to the time of your son's return, which we anxiously await, that it will get more difficult. But that doesn't stop us, Father, from asking you right now for a revival, that you would bring people to a repentance, that they would repent of their ways, and that they would come before you, Father, and get to know you, that their stony hearts would become hearts of flesh, and that they would learn to worship you and fill your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
it started in a manger, ends on a cross. And Jesus worships with his disciples before his death. They have a meal together. He serves them. Before they even have the meal, what does he do? He takes off his robe, he puts on an apron, he grabs a bowl, and he washes their feet. He worships by serving. And then, a little bit later during the meal, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. In the same way, he takes the cup and he fills it. And he tells us that this is the cup of the new covenant. His blood poured out for the sins, not just ours, but for many, for all. And not just for those that choose him, but even those that reject him. He died for them as well. As we take communion this morning, we do so because we are remembering what Jesus did for us on that cross. The body of Christ broken for you. Take me. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take me. Father, we thank you for what this meal represents to us, Father, that it is your son's body and his blood broken and shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins so that we can come before you and truly worship you. We can worship you fully. Father, as we enter this time of prayer, Father, we just thank you that we can come together corporately and that we can come to you in the quiet of our own homes and pray to you, Father. And we do that in worship. In Jesus' name, amen. This does bring us to the part that Denise, I would normally have Denise come up here and she would <laughs> pray for us. And Denise is, she, when we talk about worship through prayer, this is a woman who worships through prayer. I have to be careful not to be envious. But she has a heart for God and she has this, it's like she's got this conduit that just connects her. And, and we thank God for her each week, but her and Steve are off traveling. They are in Illinois visiting his side of the family. so. We just pray for safe travel and that they are having a good time enjoying their family this Thanksgiving. Are there any prayers or praises that anyone would like to lift up? Um, during this first email, saying that Keith took a turn last night. Keith and Jane are good friends. Keith has been wheelchair bound for a few years now, but uh, in her email she said, Keith took a turn last night, he is very stiff, and she is not sure how much more that she can do for him. She's having Julie, their daughter, come and help them to get him in and out of bed. This is her prayer, that he would not suffer long. When it's family and friends, it hits you just a little bit harder. You may be in that situation today with a friend or a family member where they're in a situation where Life is getting more difficult because of an illness and you don't know what the future holds. That's why it's so important that we 
we know God and that we worship him fully. Are there any prayers, other prayers or praises that anyone would like to lift up? The travel, please. Absolutely. Travel for Mark. Prayers for these this mechanical issue. Prayers that he is now been on the plane for 11 minutes <laughs> and that he will have a safe flight to and from Orlando. And certainly he's going down into a very busy metropolitan area, so prayers for his daily travels as well. You never know what's going to happen when you get behind the wheel or you get into the car or something. He might be getting into somebody else's car. You never know what's going to happen what the next minute brings. So we pray for safe travel there. I start, I start a, I'm blessed to be able to start a new job Monday, so I've done this job before, but it goes along with what I did over the summer, just in a different aspect of it, so. Okay. Well, praise God. It's a time where we can come and give God all the glory for this new job that Doug has. We thank God for that. worship God through prayer. Father God, we pray for travel for Steve and Denise. We pray for travel for, for Mark. We, we pray for Keith and Jane and their family as it does sound like Keith's time may be coming to a close. We thank you for the life that he has lived and for his love for you and how he, I know he has worshipped you. He worshipped through service. That was his way. We pray for all those out there that are hurting, who are sick, who do not know what the next moment brings. But in the same time, Father, even though the we are lifting these folks up to you and, and it seems like hope may be lost. It's not. Because we know where Jesus, Keith's heart is. Help us to make sure that others do too. Father, we give praise for Doug that he has this new job starting on Monday. Just thank you for that part. We thank you for those that uh, need you and are reaching out to you, Father, that are coming before you and worshiping you, that you would help to meet all the needs, whether that is clothing, whether that is food, whether it's a place to sleep, whether it's medical care or end-of-life care. We thank you, Father, that you are in and of it all. In Jesus' precious and holy name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. This does bring us to the end of our online portion. Those of you that have been watching online, Diane will paste that link again into the chat so that you can click on that and worship with us this morning. And as you hear these songs, as you listen to these songs, as you sing these songs, prepare your hearts. Let it not be an emotional response, but a worshipful response to God.